circuit, we draw a schematic, we simulate that, we build it, and then we measure it and say, did it actually do what we said it was going to do in our simulation? And if it doesn't, we go back, we change the schematic, and we redo all that. So did we, did we just make one process, one pass through that process and have it work? No, it does not always work every time. So the question is why? Well, there's lots of reasons. Sometimes we're stupid engineers and do dumb things. Sometimes there's components that aren't ideal that don't do exactly what they say they're going to do. Uh, so in the picture here, I got a bunch of different components. These little teeny uh, kind of orangish ones there are capacitors, but so is the big yellow one. But they're different kinds of capacitors and you use them for different things. And each of those components has uh, characteristics of other components. So every capacitor is mostly capacitive, but it's also resistive and inductive and so on. So the result is that even though these components have some problems with them, and we don't typically simulate all those, the output is that the simulation doesn't always match what, what we wanted it to be. So can we account for those differences uh, in building an actual radio? Yeah, in most cases we can. There are some of the things we can do, but in some cases we can't. So here I'm showing you three different kinds of capacitors. The top is a multi-layer ceramic, the next one down is an electrolytic, and the bottom one's a tantalum. And if you're an electrical engineer, you look at each one of these and you say, yeah, I know I'm going to use those in different places. But it's because they do have things that are different about them that make them work or not work in different kinds of circuits. And so these are common components and some of the problems we have with them. So let's talk about a real world example. Let's talk about filtering. So everybody's heard the term brick wall filter. Well, what really is a brick wall filter? If you take frequency along the bottom and the response along the, t on the side here, this is what you want a brick wall filter to do. On the left and the right of the passband, you want to block everything. And in the passband, you want to pass everything. So this is how a brick wall filter looks from a plot standpoint. But well, when you actually go build something like this, you have to use real components. So one of those orange panel and capacitors, this is the actual schematic diagram if you want to simulate it. Well, yeah, it's got capacitors in there, but it's got a lot of resistors and inductors and all kinds of stuff. And nobody ever simulates down to this level as a general rule. So what you have are you build the circuit out of this stuff, and it doesn't perform exactly like you'd like. So let's go back into the world of radio and talk about how radios are built and what we can do about that. So in my block diagram here, I'm going to have two different colors. I'm going to use yellow for things that are analog, and I'm going to use green for things that are digital in the world of ones and zeros and computer stuff. So when we simulate a filter, this is what we do. We take a bunch of numbers that represent the time response of that signal. We run it through software that does a filter simulation. It outputs a new set of numbers, and we might actually put those in a digital to analog converter to put it back in the analog world and listen to it in a speaker and say, did that filter or whatever it is do what we thought it was going to do? Now, there are limits to what you can actually do when you go simulate something and build it. Uh, in simulation, I can put as many filter stages of resistors and capacitors or whatever I want in there and simulate it because everything in my math simulation is ideal. I can do that as, for as many filter stages as I want. In the real world, because each one of these components has slight variations and there's crosstalk on the board and other kinds of things, there's only, and their components are expensive, there's only so many filter poles or taps you can put in there to actually make it work well. So the question is, could we pull all those analog components out and actually put our filter simulation in the circuit? In other words, could we put an analog to digital converter, run our filter simulation, but run it in real time and make it work as a digital filter, and then output it back to a speaker? And so this is the first introduction to software-defined radio that ever got done, or putting software in a radio. So it was first done after the demodulator. We put an analog to digital converter, went into the digital domain, put our DSP filter in there, and then went back to the digital domain. And this let us have in software a filter, which we could change the, com change the uh, width of and do things like that. So it gave us a, a unique capability. Now, I'm going to ask the question, is this a software-defined radio? I'm going to argue it's probably not. Uh, a software control, control radio is one you use software to control things, but to me a software-defined radio is where the radio itself is defined by software. So your modulation scheme, how your transmitter and receiver work, and all that should really be in software. And I have reasons for saying why I think that's an important thing to do in, a, in, in calling something a software-defined radio. So these are some examples of filter shape factors. Uh, several of these came from real analog radios, but the red one came from an SDR radio. And you can see, it, although it's not a perfect brick wall, it does go straight up, come across the top, and pretty much go straight down. And that's what we're looking for. In the uh, Flex 6000 series, this is what our 500 hertz brick wall quote unquote filter looks like. So it's not really quite a brick, is it? It does have some taper down there, but you can see the taper is down at minus 100 dB, so it's way down in the noise. 
Uh, so this is a really good filter, and it has a shape factor of 1.35 for people who know about shape factors and filters. This is our sideband filter at 2.8 kilohertz, and it has a 1.06 shape factor. A 1.0 shape factor is perfect. So the real next step that came in software-defined radio was moving that analog to digital converter back up the chain some more. So now we go put it in front of the demodulator and we put the demodulator in software. So what does that buy us? Well, now we have the capability of taking the demodulator and switching it out. So today maybe you have AM and sideband, and tomorrow you might have AM, FM, sideband, and CW. So you can go add new modes to that. So that's a neat thing. Is this an SDR? I would argue at this point you could call it an SDR because you can change the modulation scheme, you can change the filters, all that kind of stuff. There are still some analog components. We still got our analog mixer and our filter and all that kind of stuff. But this is really getting in the realm of what I would consider a software-defined radio. <clears throat> okay, so this is Power SDR, which we wrote uh, 10 years ago, and it's kind of the first introduction to software-defined radio in the amateur market. Okay, so I'm asking a, a, a economics question here because I'm going to kind of drill this home in a minute. What is the marginal cost of a second receiver in an analog radio? In other words, if you built a radio with one receiver and somebody said, gosh, I really want to run an SO2R, I want to run have two receivers in there, what does it cost you? Well, in an analog radio, you've got to go put that mixer and the filter and all the other kind of stuff back in there. So you get to have two copies of all that stuff. And if it's any of it's in software, you can take all that stuff and put a little faster processor in and do it there. So the extent that you can eliminate having all those analog components for building a second receiver, that's also a useful thing. Okay, so why do we do software-defined radio and really what are we trying to achieve? Well, the goals are to remove distortion from the radio, which you get in analog components, get better performance out of it, the flexibility to add or change new features. So uh, we built uh, some very clever hands, uh, created uh, Codec 2 and FreeDV, which is a neat modulation scheme for doing digital voice over uh, HF radio. And uh, we added that capability to our radio, and it's going to come out in the next version of our software. We never envisioned we would do that when we had the radio, but because we can change the demodulation scheme out, that's something we, we have the capability of doing. So we, as a manufacturer, we can bring you new features as time goes on. Uh, ability to tailor the radio quickly and never before possible noise mitigation and noise uh, suppression capabilities because we can build these filters that are kind of difficult to build in the real world. Well, the next real step in software defined radio is this block here. Can we get rid of this stuff? This first mixer and the filter and the local oscillator and the IF amp, can we get rid of all that? The answer to that question is yes, and this radio is called the direct sampling radio. So uh, in this situation, we put a very fast analog to digital converter on the front end of the radio and connect it directly to the antenna. Now our mixer and our local oscillator and our filter and everything down here is actually in software. So there are a few of these radios out. The Flex 6000 is one, the HPSDR is one, and there's a couple others that are actually overseas. Uh, so why isn't everybody doing this if it's better? Well, if you take, go back into the analog world where we did this, where we had our demodulator and our filter here, uh, out of our uh, first analog digital converter, we might take 192 kilohertz and turn it into 192 kilosamples at 64 bits or 12 megabits a second worth of data. So how much is 12 megabits a second worth of data? You remember one of these? How many of you all have seen one of these before? This is a 10 megabit Ethernet card we used to put in our computers probably... I don't know, 10 years ago or so. It's more than that card could handle. But still, by today's standards, uh, 10, 12 megabits worth of data isn't a lot. And you could process it in a small processor in a radio or something like that. But if we go over here to the direct sampling radio, now all of a sudden we're pulling in something like a few hundred megahertz worth of signal at 16 bits, and you end up with four gigabits worth of data. So that's a whole lot more data, and it's a really hard thing to process in an inexpensive radio. So what is four gigabits a second worth of data? How many people in here have a gigabit network in your house? Okay, it's four times that. If you have a hundred megabit network, it's 400 of those. So it's a tremendous amount of data to process in a radio. Well, what are the benefits of it? I've talked about some of these. By putting the analog digital converter directly on the antenna, you get the best signal clarity that you can get because you don't have any of the analog components to mess things up and create mixing products and all that. You can also, if you take the entire HF spectrum and turn it into bits, and you have all that at your disposal, you could put individual receivers anywhere in there. 
So if you go by a traditional radio today, somebody says, well, what band are you on? Well, I press the 40 meter button, I'm on 40 meters and I can talk there, but I can't listen to 20 at the same time unless I bought a radio with a second receiver. Well, in a direct sampling radio, because you have the entire HF spectrum at your disposal that's already been digitized, you can put as many receivers in that spectrum as you want. So you can listen to 10, 15, 20, 40, 80, all at the same time, if that's something that you're interested in doing. Uh, it also has, these radios have extremely high dynamic range because the analog to digital converter can listen from very, very weak signals to very strong signals, and you don't have to put a preamplifier in front of them in most situations. And you have extreme flexibility in this because now that we're pulling in the whole HF spectrum, if somebody says, we have a new mode, and the new mode is we're going to send 100 kilohertz worth of digital data for emergencies to transmit patient information in a public safety, in a public safety setting, and that new mode is 100 kilohertz wide and people are coming out with radios, well, we can say, well, we'll go reconfigure everything in this radio because it's all in software and give you a different kind of receiver. The real drawback about these radios is they're very technically complex to design and they're expensive. Okay, so I had asked before, uh, what's the marginal cost to add a second receiver in an analog radio? We've got to buy all those analog components. Well, in a digital radio that's all digital direct sampling, uh, you start with this, and then you say, let's go take and add another receiver. You just go stack another receiver on top of it in software. You can add as many of these as you want, provided you have the processing power to deal with it. So you have to have more processing power. But there's a whole lot of things you can do with this radio that you can't do with a normal radio. Okay, so when we set out on this journey to go build a direct sampling radio, there were several options. And uh, if you all have ever heard of R. Buckminster Fuller, who created the Buckyball and the Geodesic Dome, he, this is a quote from him. He says, we're called to be the architects of the future, not its victims. And so we worried about the architecture in this radio. And I want to explain kind of what the choices were and what we decided to do. The first choice we had was what I call ADC in a hose, or an analog to digital converter in a hose. As I mentioned before, there's a lot of data that comes out of that analog to digital converter. We used a special component called a FPGA to process all that data. But if you want to draw pan adapters that are multi-megahertz wide, you still have to send a lot of that data out to the PC to be processed. And that's what this line uh, right here is going to the PC, and it's a big, thick line. So this was one option for us. We could have leveraged our existing power SDR and made a minimal software investment and came out with a radio like this. We've actually built a few radios like this. Uh, this is the first radio like this we built. This is called the CDRX 3200. Uh, we built it for the government, and it has 440 megabits worth of bandwidth that comes out of it, so it'll fit on a gigabit network. But our customers that buy this radio, uh, it has 32 simultaneous receivers. Uh, they say they have trouble absorbing the bandwidth that comes out of this radio, and they're government customers. So we were concerned about what this would mean for hams. This is another radio that we built. We built this radio just a few years back, and uh, this radio has 24 microwave analog to digital converters and it has two very large FPGAs in it. And on the front of it are four 10 gigabit Ethernet connectors. So it has 40 gigabits a second worth of data coming out of it. And our customers that use this radio have PCs that have hundreds of gigabits worth of data, and they burst copy data coming out of it. Again, we didn't think this was the kind of thing that the typical ham's going to want to do, build a supercomputing uh, system in order to run a radio. So we looked at this. This is another option, which is to put another block there inside the radio, inside that green box which we have, we say CHL, BB, and DSP, which is a channelizer, baseband processor, and DSP. Well, what does all that mean? Well, what it means is we're going to take an individual radio channel and process it, do all the filtering and everything that needs to be done inside the radio, so all that we send out to the PC is just what needs to be displayed and controlled on the PC. So take a, uh, a pan adapter display. Let's say you want to show a megahertz worth of data. Uh, if you do it uh, using the old architecture, the ADC and a hose, you've got to send a megahertz worth of data out to the PC at many, many bits per second. And this way, you just send what needs to be painted on the display. And I'll show you an example of that in a minute. So these are some examples of the ADC and a hose architecture. Uh, HPSDR, the Hermes, the Anon radios all use this older architecture. This is what uh, the new architecture is uh, using a Flex 6000. So as I, I mentioned, these are some of the benefits of it. You get consistent performance independent of the PC because we pulled all the, the computing required to produce audio, uh, transmit, uh, draw pan adapters, all that stuff is done inside the radio. We also minimize the network bandwidth, and this is very key to us because we believe that the future is moving to remote use of ham radios for lots of reasons.
One is for convenience. So if you're at the grocery store and you find out that a DX station is on, you might actually like to work that guy from your, your cell phone or something. Uh, that's not going to happen probably tomorrow, but I think in five or ten years you'll see more of that happening. But also a lot of people now have HOAs, and you might not be able to build a station that you want in your backyard, so remote operation is a lot more of a thing that people think about. It minimizes system problems that occur when you put a PC in the system with the radio. It's a self-contained platform, and then I talked about the Spectrum Display independent of bandwidth, which I'll show you in just a minute. And this kind of system is optimized, as I said, for network use. All right, so let me show you what this means from a Spectrum Display standpoint. On the left is Smart SDR, which runs on our Flex 6000, and on the right is Power SDR, the software that we wrote before, which uses the older ADC and a hose architecture. So if I want to show a megahertz worth of bandwidth in the pan adapter, under Smart SDR with the Flex 6000, that takes roughly 500 kilobits a second worth of data going to the, to the PC. But with Power SDR, it takes 77 megabits a second, so it's a 150 to 1 bandwidth difference. Now, if you're running your local LAN in your house, you don't really care about this. It doesn't matter. But if you want to go remote and actually operate this from your iPad in the grocery store or something, you can't send 77 megabits worth of data down a cellular connection. Not for long, anyway. If you up this to 10 megabits or 10 megahertz worth of bandwidth that you want to show, the Smart SDR solution stays the same because you're drawing the same size pan adapter, and that's the data that we send. We don't actually send all the details. On the right-hand side here, you go up to 770 megabits a second. Now you're struggling to fit it in the home network. So this is why we switched to this architecture and what the benefits of it are. All right, well, let me spend a little bit of time talking about uh, why I think network is important. So uh, those of you that have actually been to a rock concert or any kind of concert in the 90s, remember this is what it looks like. Uh, on the left, except that you might see people holding up lighters in the air. Uh, in, the, in the 2010 kind of era, now what you see instead of people holding up the lighters in the air is they're all holding up cell phones and iPads and stuff like that and filming what's going on. And all that data has to go somewhere. So from a networking standpoint, the first things to really hit the internet were the sharing of photos, then video, uh, sound, in this, sound is an emerging capability, and data is the next capability. So you can have applications that consume data from multiple sources on the Internet and use it. And uh, both of those are, you know, sound and data are becoming very popular now. So this chart was done in, I think it was uh, 2013. Uh, but this shows uh, the rise of data going on on the cellular networks or the Internet at large. The blue is uh, data from Facebook and the green is stuff from an application called Snapchat that lets you show pictures. But you can see that the network stuff is growing astronomically. This is the mobile use of global internet traffic uh, by year. And look at the trend line of that. Mobile internet use is going way up. In fact, in China, it's actually crossed where the mobile internet traffic shown here in yellow uh, has actually surpassed the desktop internet traffic. So everyone is going mobile. They're taking their fun with them. And as amateur radio operators, we want to do the same thing. Uh, you know, driving cars now, you, most of your cars have more computers in them than you have in your house. Okay, so the real point in networking is everything is moving to the network, and you want to be able to take your fun with you. So this does raise an important question about what constitutes a contact. So I want to talk about this a minute. So uh, I live in Texas, so this is drawn with Texas on here, but let's say I'm talking to uh, Christmas Island over RF and I'm making a contact. Everybody knows this is a valid contact. The blue dashed line here is RF and we're talking on the air. He sends me a QSL card, we're good. What about if I send an email with the operator on Christmas Island and he sends me a joking email back and says, you're 599 here. And we, we communicate over email, is that constituted contact? Can you get a card and get it checked and get DXCC for that? No. Okay, what about if uh, I have my local two meter remote base and I'm talking on my handheld and I talk to my local two meter remote base which transfers the signal over the internet and it pops out on the local repeater there on Christmas Island and the guy talks to me there. So the major transport is over the internet but both of us are using RF. Can I get a card for that for talking to Christmas Island? No, everybody says no. Okay, how about if I flip that around? where I'm at the grocery store and I got my iPad and I'm talking over the public communications network to my house where I have my tower and that tower is talking to Christmas Island and I'm working the guy like that. Do I get a card for that? Everybody says yes. Okay. 
Well, this is what I think too, and I think this is where we're going to end up. And it raises the question, does your radio need an Ethernet connector on here so you can do this kind of thing? And does your radio run on one of these platforms? So true or false, Rare DX is convenient. I would, I would say false, it's not always convenient. So I think, I think maybe your operating station looks like this today, and tomorrow it might be this. You might be sitting on the curb somewhere with an iPad talking to somebody. Yeah, you'll look a little funny, but hey, if you're getting a new country, it's what's important, right? <laughs> you see us in the grocery station, university departments talking in our iPads or whatever. Okay, uh, I want to get off that for a minute and talk about some of the new technologies in uh, software-defined radio that have come up that are interesting technologies. Um, one of them is adaptive pre-distortion. And uh, how many people in here have heard of adaptive pre-distortion? Okay, so a lot of people have. Uh, the concept here is that the final amplifier in your radio, whether it's your 100-watt amplifier or your tube amplifier that's making a kilowatt or whatever, is inherently nonlinear. And uh, as radio engineers, we do everything we can to make them as linear as possible, but they do have nonlinearities in them. So uh, this is an example using uh, the HPSDR Pure Signal software, which is designed to do this. And this is a two-tone test, which is particularly hard on a radio. We've got two tones there, and then you can see this Christmas tree of other tones that comes out of the radio. Well, all those get transmitted on the air because of those nonlinearities in your PA. And with pre-distortion, we can knock a lot of those down and end up with a signal that looks like this. So this, is a, this doesn't help your operating, it helps your neighbors operating, right? So if everybody did this, then the bands would be a lot cleaner. So this is a neat thing that's new. Uh, it's available in some of the uh, radios that are using HPSDR architecture. Another uh, thing that's happening in radios is uh, the slow reduction of phase noise in radios. So how many people in here know what phase noise is or care about phase noise when they shop for radios? See, this is a technical area. Usually when I ask that question, I get like two hands or something, not very many. So uh, phase noise is just the, the vibration, essentially, of your carrier frequency in your receiver, in your local oscillator, your receiver, your transmitter. Uh, so if you think about it, if you're listening to 14.1 and you've got a local oscillator there, it's going to move a little bit. And that movement creates noise around it, and that noise, when it goes through mixers, tends to spread all the signals that you listen to or your transmitter frequency over a wide range of frequencies. And that noise raises the band noise and causes all kinds of problems for other hams around you and for your listening capability. So the, the most common thing that I can talk to you about to, where you've experienced phase noise is if you've been at field day and you've got an adjacent operator who's transmitting, and you're listening, let's say it's a CW guy, and you're listening on phone, and the noise floor's being modulated, and you hear this while the guy's talking, that's phase noise. And so what we really want to do is we want to have a clean transmitter signal and a good receiver that neither one have bad phase noise on them so you can hear better. So this is done, uh, what's the name of the club? Thunderbird uh, Amateur Radio Club. Thunderbird Amateur Phoenix. Radio Club uh, did this uh, deal where they had all Flex 6000s at their field day which has the Flex 6000s built with a very good phase noise oscillator on both uh, receive and transmit. So these are the guys here. And uh, this is kind of a uh, wide chart here, but this is a pan adapter display. But these guys were copying sideband signals, which you can see all here. And way down there where you see that white hot signal, that's a PSK31 signal. And it's being transmitted just down the band at the same time they're copying sideband. And this PSK31 signal did not bother the sideband guys at all and they actually had a CW station on at the same time. So this is a really neat capability that's coming into ham radio. So you want to pay attention to the phase noise of your receiver and your transmitter. All right, this is another unique thing that's come up in the last uh, year or so. Uh, at Dayton in 2013, David Hirschberger, W9GR, came up to us and said he had a really unique uh, sideband uh, speech processing system, which he called companion on or continuous envelope single sideband. And uh, we talked about this um, and decided that we would try it out on the Flex 6000 and see how it worked. Uh, we tried out his algorithm and found that, uh, well, see, how many of you have used a speech processor on your transmitter? Oh, sorry. Lots of guys. Have you all ever used, like, uh, I remember the first radio I ever used was an F uh, FT767GX or something like that from Yesu. And this is a very early radio when I was a kid. And you'd turn up the speech processor on it, and you'd sound like Mr. Roboto on the air. And people would be like, hey, 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 turn your processor down. I can't stand to listen to you like that. 
Well, this is not like that. This is a very uh, good algorithm that makes you sound just like you normally do. It has minimal distortion, but boosts your uh, power by up to 2.5 dB. This is kind of what we saw in it. And uh, the algorithm and how he built this is going to be published in QEX uh, in the next couple of months, I think. This is the results of this uh, processor. So the blue is without the processor, and the red is with the processor on, and using the same program material. So this is a total power output. So you can see it substantially boosted the power output on the signal. So what does this mean? This means you get heard further away if you're trying to talk to somebody. It's something we've implemented, and it's been in our software since version 1.2 or 1.1. I can't remember when we added it. In fact, it, it was so good that we pulled out the uh, compression algorithm that we had and replaced it with this one. And we recommend you run it all the time. There's an off position, but the only guys I think really should run it off are the ESSB crowd that has a standalone set of processing equipment they want to use. Um, another neat feature that's available in radios now is being able to have many data streams at once. So in the Flex 6700, for example, which is our flagship product, you can have eight narrowband 24 kilohertz receivers, eight pan adapters, four wideband 192 kilohertz IQ streams, uh, all at the same time. And so uh, this gives you a lot of unique capabilities because you can run um, uh, four-band CW skimmer with the IQ. Uh, you could run multiple uh, Whisper or WSJTs or run FL Digi on multiple bands decoding PSK31 or RIDI signals. So this is all now available in a single radio platform, which before you had to have multiple devices and all kinds of things to do that. Yes? Does that use multiple AVDs for receiving or all? Yeah, so that's a good question. Uh, uh, in our product line, we have three radios, a 67, a 65, and a 63. In the 67, there's two ADCs, so you could put those on two different antennas. In the 65 and the 63, there's one ADC, so you have to use one antenna. Uh, but the, the interesting thing about this is when we designed the radio, our belief was if you put a single ADC on a 20-meter beam, you wouldn't be able to see hardly anything on 40 or 10 meters or anything like that, it would be pretty useless. And we were thinking everybody was going to say, oh my gosh, i got to run out and buy a log periodic antenna. Uh, or a multi-band uh, multi vertical antenna with lots of traps or whatever else. Uh, the truth of the matter is that you do lose 5, 10 dB on the other bands in a typical antenna, but you can still see a lot. So if you were trying to copy a signal that's 3 dB out of the noise floor and you're on a non-resonant antenna, like you're listening on 10 meters but your antenna is a 20 meter antenna, you're not going to be able to see that signal 3 dB out of the noise floor. But if it's 10 dB or more out of the noise floor, you'll be able to see the band activity. So it's still excellent for watching for openings and stuff like that. <clears throat> Another unique capability is uh, multi-mode waterfall to be able to show many different modes at the same time uh, on the same display and be able to watch other bands. So that's a neat deal. Here we're showing a waterfall plus a band scope. So this is a, what we call a pan adapter or band scope. And you can see the frequency across there and the signals. And we're, we're showing a waterfall here. And you can have multiple ones of these. In fact, what we're showing here, on the left, we go all the way down to 0 megahertz and here uh, up to 28 megahertz. So we have 0 to 10, meg, uh, 10 meters all being shown in one pan adapter, kind of hidden down at the bottom. So you can watch and see whether or not the band's going to open or what's going on there. I mentioned CW Skimmer, and uh, this is a really neat capability to have inside the radio. Before, if you wanted to run four-band CW Skimmer, you'd have to buy multiple radios that supported multiple uh, high bandwidth output, or you'd have to buy a standalone radio that supported four of these. Uh, with a Flex 67 or 6500, you could produce four of these displays at the same time while you're operating on the bands. So we actually have this out in the show if you want to see what it looks like. I think we're just running two today. but. <clears throat> digital modes are now easier than they've ever been. Uh, I remember my first digital setup, I had an uh, ICOM 756 Pro 3 and I had a little external box that connected to the transmit line and the audio line and all that and it balanced everything, ran it through transformers and had a uh, USB dongle that I plugged in my computer to key it and all that. So I had this rat's nest of cables and when I go to transmit on the air because I had a uh, uh, antenna that would get into my set some, I had to wrap everything around toroid. So I had to go to a lot of trouble to do digital modes. Today you don't have to do all that. You can take uh, 
with, uh, we have DAX in our radios now, which takes the uh, signal off the air, uh, turns it into bits, sends it across the Ethernet cable to your radio, and then makes it available as a sound card uh, in the computer, sends it over the computer. So this allows you to run digital modes without any extra cabling. So you just have a single Ethernet cable running from your radio over to the computer. And with the 6700, you can run eight of them at once. And uh, I don't know too many people running eight at once, but you can do it. Uh, here's an example here where we're doing this. Uh, we've got a uh, CW skimmer over here, and we're running multi-mode digital stuff. You can run uh, four whisper or eight whisper uh, instances at the same time. One of the things I think you're going to see over time, today this is kind of hard to set up because you've got to open Whisper multiple times and point it at uh, different sound cards and do all that. But we'd like to see a program like this come out that says, which bands would you like to run Whisper on today? And you can say, oh, give me 40, 80, 10, 15, whatever. And it'll go connect to the radio and run all those at the same time without having to force you to go through all the setup. Here's uh, Easy Pal running through our radio. Have y'all ever seen Easy Pal before? You can go. One of the funny things about Easy Pal is when it's done, it sends a series of carriers that will write your call sign into a pan adapter or into a waterfall, so you can see the guy's call sign here. Could you explain that? What Easy Pal is? Uh, Easy Pal is a uh, uh, digital mode program, and one of the things it lets you do is uh, file transfers. Uh, you, it'll take a file and put it somewhere, and then over the air, it'll send the address of the file. So you can say, I want to transfer this file. It sends a very short address over the air, and then the guy comes around through the back of the Internet or whatever and grabs the file. So you can do things like that with it. I don't know all of its capabilities. I'm not a regular user of it. Oh, yeah, we're using it for slow scan TV. Yeah. Okay, the slow scan TV as well. The... the uh, Benefits of having a pan adapter have really uh, grown a lot with the capabilities in the, I mean, the, of having a waterfall now have grown a lot. So uh, this is a, uh, an example of uh, Greg, our, one of our guys, our sales guy that's uh, working TX6G. And uh, here's the waterfall uh, at the time he made this contact. So can you all look at this waterfall and figure out what's going on, what this DX station's doing and how he's working? This is one of the really neat things about having an SDR and, and chasing DX. So let me, let me kind of show you what's going on here. Uh, this signal right here is the DX signal. And then these are all the guys up here that he's chasing, all this stuff, or that are trying to chase him here. So you can see he'll make a call, he'll call CQ, and then all these guys respond. And then he says, oh, I want to talk to this one guy, and there's the guy he's talking to. So you instantly know exactly where the DX is and who he's working. And furthermore, you can watch this over time and see whether or not the guy he's working is marching up and down the band, or does he go up the band and start back down, or is it random? And so you, you can follow the pattern that the DX station is using and be the next guy that he talks to. That's a pretty neat capability. In version 1.4 of our software, we're going to add a button up here that says remote and you'll actually be able to run remote audio. Now for us today, remote means uh, inside your local LAN. So uh, if you have your radio in your shack and you want to happen to take your laptop computer out and sit in front of the TV and watch the football game, uh, you can run this and have the, the audio routed to your computer. You can hook a microphone to your computer and actually work somebody with it. Uh, so this is a capability we'll have at the end of this month and we'll be moving this into full WAN remote uh, over the next year. Any idea? With a full WAN remote? Yeah. Uh, I don't. Um, uh, for us, internally, when we talk about software development things, we have things that we call just work, and we have things we call science projects. And the things that are just work are either things that we've done before that we know exactly how to do and we just have to go do it. And the science projects are ones where we've not done them before and we don't know exactly what stumbling blocks we might hit. This is a science project for us, is WAN remote, and so we've been kind of coy about saying sometime next year. Uh, this remote capability to do audio over the LAN is a huge stepping stone for it. Uh, even though we didn't have to compress the audio, we're running compressed audio over the local LAN and getting really good performance out of it because we know that's a necessary step for the wideband or for the for the WAN remote capability. Uh, so uh, I don't know exactly when it's going to be. We're, we're walking in that direction, and as soon as we have it, we're going to release it. But I just don't know when it's going to be. All right, well, the rest of my time, I want to spend a few minutes talking about what I think some of the things that are going to happen in the future of software-defined radio are and how they're going to uh, impact our community. 
Uh, so today, if you look from a decoding standpoint, we can decode CW, PSK, RIDI, all those kind of things on the air. Uh, tomorrow, I think we'll be able to decode everything that you can see digital and voice, and we'll probably be able to decode all that stuff at the same time. So it's going to take some leaps in processing power and capability, uh, but there's no reason to think that you won't be able to turn your radio on and have it point to all the signals and say, this is so-and-so, and, -so and he's, he's in this location, he's running ready, and this guy's doing this, and all that sort of stuff. So I think that's a neat capability that'll be there in the future. Uh, this is an example of what you can see today uh, from a digital signal decoding standpoint. I don't know if you all can see that real well, but there's a number of different digital signals in there. And if you watch this kind of stuff on the air a lot, you can identify what all these are, partially by what the signals look like, but also partially by where they are in the band. Like as an example, uh, this signal is PSK31. Well, you might not be able to tell that from where you are, but if you look at the signal close enough, you can see the two carriers and watch them go back and forth. And a trained eye can spot that and say that's a PSK31 signal. The guys up here are all JT65. How many people in the room knew that? Yeah, you guys that run that know exactly what that looks like. So this is a single tone mode that's going to vary back and forth in frequency. And how about this mode in the, in the middle? Do you all recognize this? Do you all know what this mode is here? Uh, that mode is uh, Olivia. And uh, how many of you all have heard Olivia before? It's the one that goes, but you remember at the, you mean to do that again? At the end of that, <laughs> you remember at the end of that mode when you're listening to it, it goes, doo -doo -doo -doo. you remember that? And so you can see that very clearly in this picture. If you're watching it, here's all the tones bouncing around, and then here's the, doo -doo 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 at the end of it. So that's an Olivia signal. And again, if I can see that with my eyes, we can decode it in the computer like that in the wide bandwidth. And then this signal up here, which you can hardly see, is uh, JT9 which is like JT65, but narrower bandwidth. But I think in the future we'll be able to decode all that stuff uh, with great precision without having to run external software. All right, so let's talk about the future of remote. Uh, today a lot of people are running remote radio in some form or another, but it's mostly hacked together and it's kind of inconvenient, and it's like, well, it's not working today, or i got to do this, or they're running multiple software packages to do it. I think the future of this is that it's going to be easy to remote everywhere and everyone's going to be doing it. And uh, this is really one of the main goals for, for our radio and why we built it is to enable this. Uh, integration is a real problem today. If you have a, uh, if you have a station with an uh, adjustable antenna, a rotator, an amplifier, all those kind of things, if you're sitting in front of that equipment, it's not a big deal. You can reach over there and press the band button or maybe have software that does that for you. Uh, you hear a DX station, you either turn the rotator or maybe you type in his call sign and the logging program moves it for you. Uh, but tomorrow, if we're doing a lot of remote operation, you have to be able to do all this stuff remote. And so that raises the bar on what the challenge with integration is. So uh, today, there's a lot of on-premise integration that's primarily driven by the contesting community. And I think tomorrow you're going to see integration driven by a bunch of remote solutions that, that really force this. I think every, everybody today is saying, I want remote, I want remote, I want remote. As soon as remote comes out, everybody's going to say, well, I got remote, but I can't use my amplifier now. I can't turn my antenna. So that's going to put pressure on that. Uh, signal classification is, I think, a, uh, a thing that we're going to be doing in the future. Today, there's virtually none of this going on. But I think tomorrow, uh, we'll be able to find and classify signals everywhere. Kind of the end point of this is that you'd be able to turn on your HF radio and say, I want to talk to so-and-so, but I don't know where he is. And he'd say, oh, yeah, I hear him. He's on 28 megahertz, and he's using CW today. Uh, antenna steering and multiple input, multiple output antenna systems is also a, a really unique, uh, a really interesting area of research. Uh, today, there are some phased receive antennas, like those of you that have uh, used these on the low bands, uh, 160 meters, 80 meters, maybe even 40 meters, put up multiple receive antennas and use them. There are also transmit solutions for this. Uh, uh, who's the blue company? Array Solutions makes a box. You can get a box about this big and run some cables in and out of it that'll let you phase the antenna and say, okay, I today I want Europe and, and then I want Africa or whatever and switch it. But it has uh, predefined locations that you're gonna switch it to a few of those based on the phasing cables that are there. 
in the future we can have multiple transmitters that we put on those antennas, one transmitter per antenna, and we can direct the signal anywhere. We can say now it's an Omni, or now it's pointed towards Africa, or now it's pointed towards Europe, or whatever you want to do with it. I think there's a lot that can be done in the visualization realm today, too. Uh, the, the stock and trade of the SDR that everybody recognizes an SDR by today uh, are the pan adapter and the waterfall, and those are very uh, interesting uh, ways to look at the spectrum, but I think uh, in the next few years you'll see more and more uh, visualization techniques uh, that occur. Uh, the the right-hand picture here is an example of a spectrum analyzer that's made by Tektronix that actually shows you a time component. So after the signals are there, uh, over time they fade out. And what they're trying to show you in this picture is you've got some uh, hopping signals that are moving around here and it shows you where they've been. And this is a sweep signal that they show you the history of that sweep signal. So is this gonna have a useful uh, uh, thing in amateur radio? I don't know about that one, but there might be other visualization techniques that we can show that would be very useful. An example of them is, uh, let's say that you have uh, uh, multiple antennas that you're receiving on and you can get a rough idea of where people are located. Are they in Europe or are they in uh, the Middle East or wherever else? You could colorize those signals in the pan adapter based on that. Uh, a lot of advances still can be made in noise reduction. Today we have advanced noise uh, blanking and noise reduction techniques in virtually every amateur radio. Uh, but tomorrow I think you'll see, uh, in the future, you'll see dedicated noise receivers used to eliminate noise and a lot of new uh, uh, noise reduction techniques. Uh, today there's occasional remote base operation from a networking standpoint, uh, but tomorrow I think we'll have the capability of uh, using remote assets uh, to go accomplish a greater goal. So for example, let's say that you're a uh, margin at control and you want to be able to hear people in multiple parts of the country, but for whatever set of reasons you can't hear all those guys, uh, you might employ remote receiving stations where the data gets sent over the network to your radio and processed and it chooses or votes or does optimal combining on those signals to give you the best uh, signal you can have. So as a net control station, that's a nice thing. You could do that and never ask for a relay again. All right, well, that's all of my slides. I'm happy to answer questions if y'all have questions. Oh, I know there's questions. Who had the idea for that right there? Um, my wife, our marketing manager. Really? Yeah. <laughs> when can you reach, how soon in the future can you go up to six meters and uh, so, um, most of the SDRs that are out there will operate on six meters. Uh, all of ours do. Uh, two meters, some of ours do. And you can always use those radios as IF receivers for higher bands if you want to do that. That's true of most radios. Well, you've got an Ethernet connection now to the open world on these radios. Have you defined open APIs and what are your, are you using industry standard things, stuff other people are doing, are you defining your own? And if you're groundbreaking new stuff, I'm sure you have to define some of your own. Are you publishing them? How does that work? And who writes the software that works with your radios? Yeah, okay, so the question is about interfaces into the radio and open APIs. Uh, so uh, because this is an Ethernet radio, we have to use uh, Internet kind of protocols, and we went and looked at what's available. From a uh, transmitting samples or uh, RF data over the air, there's a, there's a uh, protocol called Vita49, which was instituted by a number of receiver companies. And so we use that both for receiver and transmitter data as well as as an encapsulation protocol for our pan adapters, waterfalls, and other data that doesn't necessarily quite comply with receiver data. And so we're using that standard exclusively for transmitting all of our data that is uh, uh, streaming data. For control, uh, we didn't really see anything from a radio control standpoint that seemed to be a very good standard. Uh, so uh, we've done some of our own control protocols in other radios that we built for the government. And uh, we decided those are primarily binary packet-based kind of things. And we didn't feel like those really fit the ham community as well. And so uh, we created a ASCII-based protocol uh, for controlling the radio. So you do things like create a slice receiver on this frequency, tune the slice receiver to this 
frequency, change the mode of it to this, show a pan adapter that's this wide. And so it's all uh, text-based, it's very easy to read. And uh, we've published uh, that uh, API that has the uh, TCP IP stuff in it, as well as a implementation. Uh, if you look at our client, our clients in Windows uses uh, Visual C Sharp, Visual Studio running Microsoft C Sharp, and uses Windows Presentation Foundation. That application is layered on a .NET DLL, which we wrote, uh, called FlexLive, which translates between the world of Microsoft's event-driven class-based stuff into the, the uh, uh, asynchronous communications with the radio over the TCP UDP channels. So that implementation is open source. You can go look at it, see how we did that, as well as looking at any of the stuff that we do. Uh, you can actually take the radio and the client and put them on the network and then use Wireshark on the machine where the client is and tell it to follow the TCP channel and watch everything it does. You click noise blanker, it says slice zero, noise blanker equals one. You run the knob up and it says slice you know, zero, noise blanker value equals 57. And so it's very easy to decode that and figure out what's going on there. We have a, uh, a wiki that's available online that has a lot but not all of the uh, API stuff in there. We're slowly working on that. And then we have a, uh, an internet community uh, that's at community.flexradio.com that has an API category you can go look at and ask questions if you don't uh, find answers anywhere else. Thanks. What's the maximum Uh, the question is about the maximum number of simultaneous digital modes on a 6300. So the 6300 has two wideband DAX IQ outputs. It has two narrowband DAX IQ outputs, which are audio instead of IQ data. And then you can run the two receivers and the two pan adapters. So uh, you could put two CW skimmers and two FL Digi receivers in there. Um, if, you're, if you take the IQ data, you could potentially... If you have a, a PSK31 skimmer or a RIDI skimmer or something like that, you could use that data to look at multiple things. But there's essentially four streams of data that come out of that radio in a 6300 you could look at. They're all frequency independent. They're all frequency independent. They're not complete. Uh, they're more or less frequency independent. The, 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 the two audio streams have to be within 3.5 megahertz either side of the IQ streams. So... They, they need to be, if you're going to show two pan adapters, the pan adapters are where the IQ data is output from. So if you've got one on 20 and one on 40, your IQ data has to be on 20 and 40. Then your receivers have to be somewhere in the 20 and 40 meter bands or within a couple of megahertz of that. So you could be watching the 20 meter handband and have one of your receivers on 15 megahertz as an example if you wanted to. Just marketing data, right? <laughs> <laughs> but that's the actual deal. Uh, other questions? Okay, that's it. Thanks for coming. Thank you.